Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Little Johnny begins to work at the church, and he's helping his pastor do odds and ends projects and what have you, and Monday morning comes, and little Johnny's answering the phone for the pastor. The phone rings. There's a guy on the other end, and he says, hey, good morning. I want to talk and speak to the head hog at the trough. He's like, what do you mean the head hog at the trough? Little Johnny was a little surprised, and he's actually a little offended. He goes, sir, he goes, if you're talking about Pastor Joel, he goes, you need to, you need to say hey, Pastor Joel, you can't be calling him a head hog at the trough. And the man said, he goes, oh, okay, okay, yes, sir. He goes, well, I just thought about making a $10,000 donation to the church. And little Johnny was like, well, hold on, sir. The pork, porky just walked in right now. <laughs> That's funny. I know you guys have heard that joke. But we have a series entitled, Why the Church Wants Your Money, or The Church Just Wants Your Money, and I'm trying to answer why the church. Now, if you're visiting with us for the first time last week, somebody came up and goes, hey, pastor, I I finally got my visitor, my neighbor to come. And anytime people tell me, hey, my neighbor finally came, or my husband just finally came, basically what they're telling me is like, don't mess up this morning. (laughs) It's like, okay, 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 I got you. If you're visiting for the first time, we just want you to know, listen, we don't want anything from you. As a matter of fact, we don't even receive an offering here at Crossroads Church except twice a year, and we're looking at that. Um, But we want something for you. God wants something for you. So thank you for coming, and thank you for those of you who are online worshiping with us. But the answer we said on the very beginning last week, we said the reason why the church wants your money, this church wants your money, is so that we can become the solution. So that we can love more, so that we can serve more, so that we can give more. There's a lot of things happening here in our community, and everybody matters to God, even if those individuals, whether God matters to them or not, is irrelevant. That's who God put. That's what he put in our heart. He put his spirit inside of us, and the whole purpose is so that we can give back. Give more, serve more, love more. So twice a year, we do this camp. We do uh, two offerings. One is the Easter offering. Usually, the Easter offering all goes towards in-house, And then the Christmas offering all goes back out into the community. So in your connect, you see all the beneficiaries, all the people and all the different ministries, all the nonprofit organizations around here and around the world that we are going to try to leverage the resources that God has given us through his people and go back and serve. Though they're already doing a great job at at their cause and their mission. So we just want to contribute towards that. So you can take a look at that, pray over that. And what we're asking every family to do is go home. And pray, Lord, what do you want us to do this uh, December? And you'll get some kind of a figure. You'll get something from the Holy Spirit because we're asking him to speak to you. And then uh, you get that figure and then come back in December and just put, just obey. And so if you're giving online, just make sure that you, there's a little down button. Make sure and put on there, be the solution. Because that's the only thing that's attached to this Christmas offering, okay? So that 100% of it can go back uh, to our community. Are everybody with me? Fantastic. So <clears throat> it's going to be a fantastic thing. But last week, <clears throat> wow, we had some good news. We said, <clears throat> the good news is I am rich. You are rich. Uh, from an you know, international uh, standard, if you make $33,000 a year, you are in the 1% club, Woo-hoo! which is awesome. Everybody cheer for yourself. Yay! like, wait a minute, I don't make 33000 Well, cheer for yourself anyways. You make something. <clears throat> so we said that those of us who make at least $33,000 a year are in the 1% club. Now, rich people also have problems, don't they? Here's some signs that you are a rich person. Um, you go to the store and you have an option on which car to drive. It's a rich person's problem, isn't it? Or how many um, had slow internet speed this last week? That's a rich person's problem. Uh, how many guys went to a restaurant and you actually ordered an appetizer? That's a rich person's problem. How many guys looked in your closet and you had options? That's a rich person uh, problem. 700 million people on this earth live on less than $1.90 a day. Isn't that crazy? 700 million. 
live on 1%. So you and I are rich. Actually, if you want to say this with me, God has blessed me with more than I need. I am rich. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is this. The bad news is I am rich. (laughs) Why is that bad news? Because there's a spiritual disadvantage to that. As a matter of fact, Jesus said it's hard for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. And Luke 12, it says, to whom much is given, much is required. So basically what happens is we're not careful. It's sometimes it's, it's easier to put our trust in wealth uh, than in the one who provided this wealth for us to enjoy. And so if we're not careful, we are uh, going to have that problem as well. Why are you going to ask uh, God for daily bread when you open up your pantries and it's full of bread? Because most of us, you know, we, we're okay with those kind of things. And so the tendency for rich people is to trust in their wealth rather than the one who given it to them. It distracts us from our true priorities. Many of us are more busy. There's more demands. There's more options. But we know, for those of us who understand the principle here, we know that the reason why God has given us and allowed us to be blessed is so we can be a blessing to others. Amen? The rich have a greater responsibility. And what's common among rich people is this. They don't know how to be good at being rich. And so this morning, that's what I want to do is I want to show you how you can be good at being rich. Turn to your neighbor, neighbor, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to be good at being rich. I don't know about you, but I grew up in poverty. Anybody grew up with a silver spoon? Anybody grow up in poverty? I grew up in poverty. I remember a few, this is just not too long ago. I was reflecting upon my childhood and I realized that I could never remember us taking a shower or a bath in an actual bathroom. And I was like, and dad was laughing and mom, when she was here, she was kind of smiling and stuff. And she goes, you know why? I said, what do you remember? I said, well, all I remember is a water hose outside and a tub. And he says, well, that's all we had. That's all we had growing up. It's just one generation away, which is crazy. And dad says, look, this is all we have. Let's just use what we have. Don't complain. Don't borrow. Don't go around stealing. If you, want to, if you want something, go work for it. And if you have extra, make sure you take care of your family. Make sure you go to church. Take care of your family. You have extra, and you can help somebody help somebody. And so that's kind of how we were raised. And I love how uh, dad raised me, except for the spankings. I didn't like that, but I deserved it. <laughs> <clears throat> I was grounded most of my, you know, young child's life, most of 15 years or so. You guys are laughing. You were too, probably, or you should have been, especially Jeff. Um, Mom was the same way. Mom, the two things that I remember about mom more than anything else is the song that she had in her heart and the service that she had in her hand. You know, she wouldn't, she grew up, you know, she was raised by her mother, which we called her Mama Chula. Uh, my, do- my girls called uh, my grandmother uh, the dollar grandma, but she was raised as a single mom, raised several kids, never got help, but she always had this face of contentment, and she was always generous. That's why they called her the dollar grandma, because anytime we visited grandma, she would give the girls each a dollar. If we were lacking, we said, let's go to grandma's house, at least we got a dollar. <laughs> And so we called her the dollar grandma. I grew up poor, but I had a very generous spirit because that's what was, that's what I saw. And so all of a sudden, man, you kick in the spirit of God, you kick in a born again experience, man, it just absolutely, when I got saved, I loved everybody and gave everything to everybody. I mean, I had bags of pot. I was like, I want to give this and bless people. And they thought I was crazy. They thought I was a narc. But I'm like, I don't know, man. I just, I just love you guys. And it was the craziest thing. Anyways, that's not the subject. There's three types of, three types of people. Can you put that on there? Three types of people. They're takers. All they want is your stuff. They're fakers. They have a lot of stuff, but really, the stuff has them. And then there's shakers. Movers and shakers, they leverage their stuff for the greater cause. And I noticed this about shakers and movers and shakers. They have a different view of who God is. They understand who God is. God is not some closed-fisted God. God is generous. He's open-handed. 
And he wants to take the goods that he has provided for us and share them with people. A.W. Tozer said it this way. What comes into your mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So that's the question. What comes to your mind when you think about God? Is he angry? Is he smiling? Is he out there just to test you? Is he out there to get you? Or is he out there to bless you? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. If we want to be good at being rich, our view of God and our view of money has to change dramatically. As I was writing this, here's some passages that came up in my head as I was thinking about my view of God and how a smile would come on as I began reading and writing these passages. There's some scriptures that says, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Thanks be to God who gives me the victory. I don't have to earn it. I don't have to cry for it. I have to beg for it. He gives me the victory through my Lord Jesus Christ. If I delight myself in the Lord, he will give me the desires of my heart. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall need out with him also freely give us all things. Another translation says all things to enjoy. If you be an evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give good things to those who ask every good and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. And God is able to make all grace abound so that you have all sufficiency in all things. You have an abundance for every good work. Acts 10, 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And what did he do with that? What did he do with all those benefits? He went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the enemy because that's who he is. God is a generous God. In other words, God takes us and uses his goods and he leverages it for those that are less fortunate. And we're to be imitators of God. We're to follow his example and that's exactly what we do. We receive the things that come from, from the master, but not for only for ourselves, but so that we can leverage that and to others that are less fortunate. Make sense? <laughs> Mark Twain says it this way. Kindness is the language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. I love that. You know, there is a history. When you look at uh, first century church Christianity, the greatest um, the thing that blows people away is how it survived. For 300 years, I mean, the odds were against him. Usually when there were major movements of like political interest or, you know, different things, they were backed by military power. They were backed by some kind of a force or the overwhelming of people or whatever. But the Christianity, they weren't organized. They weren't part of the government. They weren't recognized by the government. In everyday society, basically, when you looked at or you thought about Christians, you thought of them as a cult, or they thought of them as a cult. And for 300 years, they were powerless. They were ostracized socially. They were tortured physically, and they were persecuted politically. But their movement continued to grow slowly. How? One word, generosity. That's what they were known for. They were, being, they were known for being open-handed. It wasn't wealth. They didn't have any. It wasn't theology. Their beliefs were crazy, according to the standard. As a matter of fact, in the philosophy of that day, there was some thinking that was called liberalitas philosophy. I don't know if that's spelled or pronounced correctly, but I looked at that word, and I was like, that's a Spanish word. So I just said, I think it comes from, liber that's where you get liberalism. I'm not sure. But that was the philosophy. That was the mindset of that day. Libera, libera, liber, alitas, philosophy. The white people say liberalitas. <laughs> liberalitas. Well, let's talk about that. Sounds good. But the guiding principle behind liberalitas is this. You give in order to get something in return. That's not what my dad taught me. Because if you're going to give, you give it away. Not expecting anything back. Don't put that sign up yet. <clears throat> it's, it's you give so you need, and you give so that you can get something back. Everybody looks out um, for one another. You scratch, in other words, you scratch my back and I'll scratch your back. You don't waste your money on someone who can't pay you back. And the idea of generosity is you find someone that can do something for you and you give to that person first. Why? Because you know that there's going to be a return. He'll owe you then. Even the Jewish culture, 
at that time. They had a tendency to only give and display kindness to those that they would get something back from. Generosity was all about doing for others so others could do for them. And people who couldn't return anything you know, back to you, why waste your time? They're not going to get anything back to you, so why waste your time and do anything for them? You'll get no ROI. It's about the bottom line in America, isn't it? And so back then, it was if you, have, if you see someone that has stuff, do something kind to them so they can do something back to you. Well, that's not the philosophy. Think about widows and orphans. The widows and orphans, they were penniless and they were poor. If you gave to them, they couldn't give anything back to you. They didn't have anything to give. So to help them was a total waste of time. That's why a lot of them were neglected. A lot of them were were abandoned and a lot of them were not helped. Then in the middle of that mindset, in the middle of that culture, in, in the middle of Liberalita's philosophy, Jesus comes. And Jesus just absolutely shifted the whole culture with his thinking and with his teaching and with his belief system. Jesus said something exact opposite. He says, hey, give and don't expect anything in return. He said, lend and don't expect to get it back. Do for others what they can't do for you. Love your enemies. Whoa, 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 whoa. time out, Jesus. Love your enemies. Do good to them. They won't pay you back, but keep doing it. If you show that kind of kindness, and then your reward is going to be great. If you only love those who love you, that's just the barrelitas. Anybody can do that. But do for something so that they can't give back to you, but still do it anyways. And then he tells a story of like the Samaritan woman. There's a guy who was beaten and bruised, and he's laying there on the side of the road. A religious person comes by. A Sadducee, a Levite, a priest goes by, and they just walk by, and they, don't, they just turn their head. But then there's a Samaritan who goes down, picks him up, you know, bandages his, his wounds, ministers to him. And the people of that day, when he's telling that story, they're leaning in. It's like, wait a minute. Don't tell me that you're going to say that the Samaritan is the one that did the good stuff. And they're leaning in, and he's telling that story. And then he says, he says this. He goes, I need you to act like that Samaritan just totally contrary to the philosophy of that day. And they were blown away, but he went against it. And that's exactly what we're asking or the spirit of God is asking us to do in the same type of environment. Go and give, go and be generous. Use the resources that you have so that you can be uh, more loving and more kind, more serving, more giving to others. It is good. For 300 years, the Christians acted like that. Man, they loved like no one else. They served like no one else. They gave like no one else. The power of generosity influenced a whole culture more than any amount of money or any politics that were there that day. And plagues, just like this whole, uh, what do you call this thing that we just went through? COVID, we went through all this stuff. Well, they had plagues back then. And as soon as plagues would come in, I mean, it would just totally annihilate whole cities. As a matter of fact, when plague started setting in, the rich people would take their goods and their stuff and they would leave the city. Why? One, they didn't want to die. Two, they didn't want to lose their stuff. So the the, the people would leave except the Christians. The Christians were known to stay in the middle of that and go and minister to them and pray for them and serve them and heal them and be generous to them. And many of those Christians died, but no one could ever deny the power of their love and their generosity in moments of, tra- of tragedy like that. The beautiful, it's a beautiful picture, and that's exactly how the first Christian church or the first century church you know, uh, stayed in power, stayed active. All they had, they didn't have a degree from Jesus. They didn't have a bunch of guns and a bunch of tanks or any of those things. All they had was a word a word from their master. How I showed love to you, you go show that love to others. It wasn't about their beliefs, it was how they behaved. And that's what they lived on. That's how they lived their lives. It's called no strings attached generosity. That's the reason why. And listen, here's a challenge. If this type of generosity worked back then, why can't it work right now? It can work right now. We have to continue to go against 
the grain you know, of, of this culture and just think that it's all about just holding on to what we have. It's not what you have that matters. It's what you do with what you have that counts for eternity. Amen? So we're here to love more. We're here to give more. We're here to serve more. Wasn't it, isn't it the kindness of the Lord that draws a man to repentance? It's the goodness of God. It's the generosity of God. It's the compassion of God. That man just blew me away. When I gave my life to Christ, I was strung out. I just shot 80 units of dope. Many of you guys hear the story already. But all of a sudden, man, he literally in a second took all that away. And my heart was just filled with his love and his, his love for my wife, his love for people, his love for, you know, all her ex-boyfriends, his love for everybody. <laughs> I was just overwhelmed with the love of God. And one, I was so grateful for who he was. And two, it was just like an automatic, like I, wa- I wanted to give. I just wanted to be a blessing to people. I wanted to show them this, this God that I serve, and I didn't even know what I was talking about. What's wrong with you, Avalos? I was like, I don't know, man. I got to find out what's in this book. <clears throat> because that's what our Heavenly Father did for us. That's what he's asking us to do to others. Amen. God doesn't bless us to raise our standard of living. God blesses us to raise our standard of giving. And so you have to check your heart out. You have to check your heart out. If I could sum it up in two words, it's going to be this. Honor God. Honor God. And some of you guys might be saying, well, I I am honoring God. I give him 10%. That's just 10%. It's all his. It's all his. What about the other 90? What are you doing with the other 90? Now, I'm not here to get in your business, but I'm just saying, what are you doing with the other 90? Honor him with your 10. 10% is fantastic, but it's almost like, hey, here's your portion. Let me have mine. I'll do whatever I want to do with it. And that's not the philosophy. That's not the thinking. That's not how David thought. You know, there was a time when David, at the end of his life, you know, everything, he had just fought all of his enemies. All of his enemies were defeated, and he was at peace. Israel was at peace. And he began to reflect because his kingdom and him being on the throne didn't come without cost, didn't come without, you know, blood being shed. But at the very end, he was full of gratitude. But then all of a sudden, he had this thought. He said, man, the God that has been with me all this time, um, I'm living in a palace, and all he has is a tent. He says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a house for God to live in. And so that's where Solomon's temple comes into play. So he began to tell the people and he began to receive offerings. And the, they were overwhelmed at all the offerings that were given to build this temple. As a matter of fact, um, um, what do you call it? The- theologists or theology people f- f- uh, say that he personally gave what's, what's about $14 billion out of his own personal fund to fund Solomon's temple. Isn't that crazy? But he prays a prayer when it was, it was being built. And in this prayer is the key on how to be good at being rich. In this prayer, when I'm reading this prayer, it's like, this is why, this was the attitude, this was the mindset that David had about who his God was and what money was all about. And the prayer goes something like this. It's in First Chronicles, the 29th chapter. It says, praise be to you, Lord. The God of my father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. Basically, he says, man, this is all about you. He goes on to say, hit that next one. Everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom and you are exalted as head over all. In other words, you own everything. Everything belongs to you. Everything comes from you and everything is dispensed by you. And it goes on, he goes, now, our God, now listen to this. We give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Even the opportunity to be generous comes from you, is basically he was saying. You've given us the ability, because a lot of folks in America, they'll just say, like, I work my butt off for this. Well, it was God who gave you the ability and the opportunity to work your butt off. 
And that was David's mindset. In two words, if you put that principle right there, if you want to pursue one goal with all of your finances, it's this, honor God. Honor God with everything that he has given you. You know, you and I um, here lately in our community called Crossroads, in the world, we're being challenged in a lot of areas. There's a lot of stuff that are going against what the scripture or how the scripture tells us to live. You have stuff like what Pastor Joel's going through. We were just praying with folks who other cancer stuff and just on and on and on. There's tribulations always come our way, but be of good cheer. He overcame the world and he's within us and he's in us. You are in covenant. You are, you're not in a contract with God. You and I are in a covenant with God. You are rich. You have all the resources. You have his word to enlighten you. You have his spirit to lead you and guide you. You have his name. You have his love. You have his blessings. You have everything that you need to overcome anything that comes your way here on this earth. And our calling is to go out there and take the things that God has given to us. And how can we leverage it? How can we use it to honor and glorify your name for all eternity? Amen? Honor God. So you want to be good at being rich? Just evaluate where you're at and honor God with all of it. And this morning, I just want to close with one passage of scripture. It's the one we started with yesterday or last week. It's in 1 Timothy, and it says, if you're rich in this life, don't be arrogant, and please don't place your hope in wealth. It's so uncertain. Instead, place your hope in God, who richly provides you with everything for your enjoyment. Do good, be rich in good deeds, be generous and willing to share. When you do, you'll lay up a treasure for yourself that serves as a firm foundation in the coming age, and that's not all. Selfless generosity allows you to take hold of life as it was meant to be lived. Isn't that powerful? (laughs) Had a man come up to me, no joke. (laughs) Just called me yesterday. He's got investors friends that are his. They had 700 acres off of I-10 Foster Road. And they, um, they established, you know, they built on 693 of them. There's six acres that they didn't build on because years ago they had spilled some fuel. And, um, and they had to excavate it. They had to clean it. They had to get environmentally clean and all that stuff. So the last several years, they've been doing that. Now, it's fresh and clean and, and ready to sell. But they didn't want to sell it. They wanted to gift it. They wanted to give it away. And out of all the people that they know all over this area, they said, we want to give it to a nonprofit organization called Crossroads Church. He goes, are you, they call me, he goes, are you willing to accept these 6.9 acres off of 10? I'm like, heck yeah. It's like, what, what's the trick? What's going on? He goes, there's no trick. I said, well, how much is it worth? I just got the survey yesterday. $1.6 million is the value on that property. What am I going to do with that? I don't know. What are you going to do? Maybe it's the, it's the, it's the way to, to, the, to, to build the next building. I'm not sure. All I know is it came from God. And we're going to pray. And we're going to seek God. What's, all I'm saying is that, listen, I'm not expecting this stuff. But God wants to bless you. He wants to honor you. If you honor him with everything that you have, I'm telling you, you will have stories like that and more because that's who God is. If he can get it through you, he'll get it to you. Be open-handed. Be generous with everything that you have. You're in covenant with God Almighty. You are rich. You are more than rich. And he has given you his spirit. He's given you his word. He's given you his blessing. He's given you his name. He's given you friends. He's given you a church. He's given you his pastor. He's given you all these things. What are we doing with that? Let's honor him by taking the gifts that he's given us and just somehow or another giving it back to others so they can experience our heavenly father like you experienced him. Amen. If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. 
or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.